Hi, I'm jong from Meta, and Peter and I are going to talk about networking for Gen AI training and inference clusters. So generative AI is one of the hardest topics these days, and it's about creating, generating new and realistic content. And before generative models become popular, AI models were often used to understand existing information uh, like image classification and segmentation. So generative AI is about uh, generating new content versus understanding existing content. So that's the main difference. And generative AI opens up uh, new huge opportunities and new applications. So for example, image and video generations and also text generations. And generative AI goes back to 2015 when Jeff Hinton's lab at the University of Toronto showed generating an image of bowl of bananas on the table. And you can notice that how low resolution they are. And the next few years, we've seen a lot of breakthroughs. So for example, DALI and stable diffusion for image generation and GPT for text generation. And one of the important enabling technologies from 2015 until now is a huge amount of compute capabilities available and the network technologies that connect many accelerators played a very important role. And Meta contributed this field significantly. For example, this is the work in this year and then you can see that by giving a prompt of a small cactus wearing a sunglass in Sahara Desert, we can see a very convincing image and also photorealistic image compared to the images shown in the previous slide. And of course, there are large language models from Meta like Llama, and we can create a chapter from these models to have a large language model-based knowledge discovery. And actually LLMs, are the ones usually pushing the limit of infrastructures. So in this talk, we are going to focus more on the LLMs. So what do Gen AI and specifically large language models mean for system design, especially for the network subsystems? So recommendation models have been the primary AI workloads in Meta data center, but large language models have very different characteristics compared to the recommendation models. First, large language models, both training and inference, requires much more compute. And because of this, especially for the large language model training, we need huge number of accelerators to finish the training in a reasonable amount of time. And this creates a very interesting problem to the network subsystem. And also interestingly, even within LNN inference, it has very diverse characteristics for example, LLM inference consists of two stages called decoding and prefill. And the decoding has a very low latency requirement. And let's talk about more details about this, specifically for the compute demand. So this table compares how much compute we need for LLMs comparing with the recommendation models. And LLMs requires multiple orders of magnitude more compute than the recommendation models. So for example, for LLM training, for each sentence, we need about a petaflop of compute. And then we need to train with hundreds of billions of sentences. And the size of the models and the amount of data we are feeding to those models have been increasing. And this is why we need tens of thousands of GPUs for large language model training. And LLM inference also requires huge amount of compute. To provide reasonable user experience and within a low latency, we need a few petaflops of compute. And you can notice that this huge amount of compute cannot be satisfied by just eight GPUs per one host. And this is why we need a distributed inference. So the cluster of GPUs is not only needed for training anymore. So we also need them for the inference. And this is another interesting problem for the network subsystem.
As more concrete examples, these are the recent large language models trained from Meta. And the latest LAMA2 with 70 billion parameters are trained with 2 trillion tokens. And that needs 800 Jetta flops to finish the training. And this translates into 1.7 billion GPU hours, assuming we are using NVIDIA's 800 GPUs. Or more than one month, even if you, we, we are using 2,000 A100 GPUs. This is a huge amount of compute. And these foundational model LM training have been done in research supercluster. But I'd like to highlight that one of the latest model, LAMA234 billion parameter, has been trained in a production cluster using Rocky V2 network fabric. And then we were able to achieve similar speed and scalability compared to InfiniBand. And to the best of our knowledge, this is probably one of the largest production use case of Rocky V2. And then we hope this can help democratizing the LLM training using more commodity network hardware. And Adi at Meta will present more details about this. So if you are interested in more details, you can watch his talk in this same event. And the model complexity on the amount of data we are feeding into these models have been increasing exponentially. And then we don't expect that trend will stop anytime soon. And this is a reason why we need a lot of GPUs. And we are using about 2,000 GPUs these days. But we don't think that's going to be uh, enough going forward. So that's why we are thinking about 32,000 GPUs and even beyond. And our vision is achieving more than 30 exaflops, which corresponds to about one third of the theoretical peak compute capability provided by 32,000 GPUs. And this will enable training the LAMA model less than one day instead of more than one month. And this will innovate, in, enable much faster innovation and then also enable much more complex models trained with more data. And the, one of the challenges in training these large models using huge number of accelerators is using simple parallelization scheme is running out of steam. The current most common way of parallelizing these models is called data parallelization. And it's parallelizing across the inputs. But that itself is not enough anymore. So we need to use other parallelization schemes like model parallelism or pipeline parallelism. So basically we need to slice into along the multiple dimensions. And by combining multiple ways of parallelization, it generates a diverse patterns of communication. And that is also a very interesting problem for the network. So LLM inference is a very interesting problem for system design. So for good user experience, we typically care about two latency metrics. So first one is called time to first token. So basically, we don't want users to wait too long until they start seeing the first response. And then typically, we want them to be less than one second. And the second latency metric is called time per incremental token. So once we start generating tokens, we don't want them to be too slow. And then we typically want them to be less than 15 milliseconds. So basically, we are seeing every uh, tokens every 15 milliseconds. And let's look at more details. And LLM inference consists of two stages, pre-fill and decode. And pre-fill determines the time to first token. And decoding determines the time per incremental token. And what's interesting is it has, they have very distinctly different system demand. So pre-fill is about understanding the user prompt. And then it can work on multiple tokens from the user prompts in parallel. So that's why it can be very compute intensive. But on the other hand, in the decoding stage, it needs to read huge amount of, da amount of data when it's going over 
generating one output token one by one. So that's the reason why it becomes very memory intensive. So one stage is very compute intensive and the other stage is memory intensive. So the LLM inference system needs to provide very high compute throughput and also it needs to provide very high memory throughput. And that's the reason why it's hard to contain LLM inference within one host, typically with HGPUs. And going forward, we expect we need a distributed inference for LLM inference. So we need a small cluster for inference. So let's recap the first part of the talk. So LLMs requires orders of magnitude more compute compared to recognition models. And training in particular requires uh, tens of thousands of accelerators to finish it in a reasonable amount of time. And because of that, we need to use different types of model, types of parallelization. And then that generates diverse patterns of communication, uh, diverse communication patterns, which is a very interesting problem for network design. And inference also requires a small cluster. And then that inference also becomes a network problem. Now, Peter is going to talk about go into more in depth on the system design for LLM training and inference. Thank you, Jungso. And thanks for excellent presentation. My name is Peter. I'm a network engineer. And in my section, we're going to dive deeply in the effect that the large language models and GNI in general have on networking topologies and other parameters of our fabrics. So as we covered briefly in a previous section, the biggest challenge, the biggest change from LLMs to LLMs from ranking models was the increase in compute capacity requirements. What this means is that we, we now need to build much larger clusters to support training of these models. Now, a big cluster naturally separates into two large domains. One is a scale-out, and now is a collection of scale-up domains. Let's review them briefly. The scale-out domain is what connects the compute pods together. You can think of racks of servers as small pods. Scale-out is where we use th technologies like InfiniBand or Rocky to implement connectivity for tens of thousands of nodes. So this is where scalability is most important. Not so much with speeds. All speeds are not joke still. You have connectivity at the rate of 50 gigabyte per second. It's gigabyte and gigabit. On the contrast, the scale up domain is usually contained in one server. This is your NVLink technology or XGMI for a few examples. On the contrast with the scale out again, it was a short distance but very high bandwidth. Like in contemporary system, the delta between scale out bandwidth and the scale up bandwidth is about 9x. That, that means from 50 gigabyte, we're now moving to 450 gigabyte per second. And now, as we mentioned previously, when you train parallel, when you train model in parallel fashion, you generate two types of parallelism at a very high level. One is data parallel, another is model parallel. Now, scale out part of topology naturally maps to the data parallel traffic, and the scale up naturally in, in encapsulates the model parallel traffic. And now let's take a look at how this looks topologically. Jongsu spoke about the goal, the need to build topologies, which we currently contain to 32K GPUs, or accelerators. Even though it's a large number, it's not the limit. But here we are looking at a fabric that instantiates such topology. For network engineers, this isn't looking too surprising. In fact, this is a well-known closed topology, which has multiple tiers of connectivity. At the very bottom, you have your racks. In our case, each rack has 16 GPUs in two servers. So effectively, every rack has two domains of scale-up topology, scale-up bandwidth. Above those racks, you have your scale-out fabric. This is where InfiniBand or Rocky works. In our example, we have a Rocky fabric. As mentioned before, we deploy both Rocky and InfiniBand fabrics, but Rocky is also unique. You see more examples for InfiniBand in a public than Rocky. So this, this slide demonstrates you the Rocky instance. Notice that we have in each layer above the racks 18 cluster switches. Now this is important because it gives you additional capacity to protect against failures. As you will see further, failures and reliability is of utmost importance for these clusters and these designs. Now there's a lot of details to implement Rocky, 
of which Adi will talk separately in his presentation on a rocky fabric implementation. But I want to stress out that this is pushing rocky or InfiniBand to its limits by building very large clusters of thousands of GPUs. And this slide captures what happens inside these fabrics. Now, just to recap once again, when you train models, you generate two types of traffic patterns. One stem from data parallelism, another from model parallelism. Now, the most challenging part is model parallelism. But before we get there, let's take a look at data parallel patterns. There, you generate patterns like all reduce or all govern and reduce scatter. These are well known. They've been known like, for many years for practitioners who've been trying to train models before. The message size here is usually substantial, but it grows smaller and smaller as you increase the size of a scalar domain. And this is where some of the challenges become more evident. As we'll see later, latency becomes more visible. Latency here means propagation latency. Notably, however, the data parallel patterns typically can overlap efficiently with compute. It's not universal. In some cases, you won't get this for free. You have to work and optimize model to achieve efficient overlapping. However, very often, scale out part and data parallelism can be well overlapped with compute, which makes them less challenging, so to speak, for networking. Not so much model parallel traffic. Model parallel is a result of, spl of slicing the networks into pieces and trying to pass activations between those components. There you have your familiar all reduce or all to all patterns, which come from, say, tensor parallelism or pipeline parallelism. And here the bandwidth demand is much, much higher. This is where you really need the scalar bandwidth to be efficient. The size of messages is still pretty large, and your demand for bandwidth is 10x, if not more, to realize this parallelism. And most importantly, and critically, it's much harder to overlap model parallel traffic, model parallel execution with compute part. So this is where latency and bandwidth are much more important than for data parallelism. And this diagram demonstrates you how all these collectives, so to speak, map to the network topology. Here you have your scale out collectives, all reduce, reduce scatter, and all gather, which map on the cluster switches above the racks. This is where you see all these uh, rings often which result from reduced scatter that span multiple switches and go across all the racks in the topology. For instance, if your training set size is 16K GPUs, you will typically see the ring size of, if not mistaken, 1,000 GPUs spanning across all the switches. This is where latency starts to add up, but this is where you still can overlap this collectives with the computation. Now, at the bottom of this tree, you see your model parallel track. You see O reduce and others which map to the scale up domains. For example, in case of NVIDIA, it's going to be in the link interconnects. However, once you cross single server, single board, you have to run this traffic across the scale out. And this is where you see the impact of much lower bandwidth. And as we'll see, this bottleneck dictates the need to grow the scale up domains beyond one server. And so, so now let's just recap and look back and what changes with large clusters. Now, now you can say, okay, scale is great, but looks like it's the same traffic, same problems over again. Well, pretty much so. However, it's important to reiterate that latency starts to become important. What's funny, what we observed in the AI training is that latency in the network wasn't so critical as it is typically seen in HPC applications. Most of the time, because you can overlap collectives and computations. However, with LLM training, with very large clusters, you have now machines which span whole buildings. So now you have latency from switches, from the fiber, even from the transceivers, which keeps adding up. And as it adds up, it starts to be visible for smaller messages. And as I mentioned before, as you increase the parallel domain size, your message size starts to decrease. And this is where you start to see the exposed latency, and you have to really pay attention and manage which much better. Now, for the second part, reliability. Naturally, it's, you should expect that as you grow network size, as you have more components and more elements, they fail more frequently. Now, to be fair, most of failures often happen in the software land, not so much in hardware, but the hardware with scale also exhibit issues. So often when you start with systems for the first time, you have to go through a burning process. 
identify policy components, eliminate them, replace them, and so on. And this takes time. Second problem is that in, in a large system, it takes much longer, longer time to do fault isolation. You have to track the issue across much more components, and often which, which takes much more time when it does in a smaller setup. And all of that adds to training time. More time to debug, less time to run the actual computation. And finally, the thing that Jongsu mentioned, that inference for LLMs is now becoming a networking problem. Previously, we can contain the inference in single GPU. And you can see often here that when you run inference, you use only one GPU typically, or even like a single PCIe card. In the LLM case, you have two challenges. First of all, these models grow so large, you can't contain them in single GPU memory or even a single host memory. You have to go across just to keep the coefficients and optimizer states and our parameters together. Secondly, you need more compute to achieve the target latency goals. For example, during prefill stage, you need much more compute to achieve the, let's say, latency of one second for first token for large models and long sequence lengths. If you want to go to sequence lengths of 32K, 64K, or even 1000K, you have to go with a distributed inference. And that means you now have a mini cluster that implements forward pass in distributed fashion. You have to run always tensor slicing, model parallelism across multiple systems. And if you're bottlenecked by the scale out, well, yeah, it's, it's your problem to solve because now you're much, much slower. And so as a result of this trend, we foresee that the mini inference clusters are going to go to 16, 42, 64 GPUs even in modern generation. And you can expand this trend to the future. But I don't think it will go beyond 64 in the next couple of years. And now to, to recap what we have done in this section. And once again, the biggest shift for LMs was a tremendous increase in computational demand. Now, this dictates everything. As you have seen, higher computation requires larger clusters. It requires large inference fabrics and so on. Large clusters have their issues, right? There's reliability problems, there's issues with like latency, and there is logical structure which requires optimization. The biggest trend we're seeing is that scale-up connectivity now is supposed to go beyond a rack or beyond a node. This is probably the biggest change we've seen in our topologies in the last three, four years, is that explosion of bandwidth that you need to realize model parallelism. And once again, inference is, is now a multi-node problem. You have to run inference across multiple systems. It becomes like a mini cluster, similar to training, but only doing forward pass, not a backward pass. And that's it for my part. Thank you so much for listening. And Jongsu and I can take your questions now.